Okay, so hopefully you guys got all of this right for your um, first from your first video. Um, it's receptor activation, signal transduction, and cellular response. Okay, now we're going to introduce four main types of cell signaling, or how cell actually communicate. The four types are called direct contact, paracrine, endocrine, and synaptic signaling. Direct contact is when you need two cells that actually come into contact with each other, like so. So right here, drawn out on the right, is two cells coming next to each other, and they actually have these red pores. So these are pore structure of um, made of protein. And these green ions are actually able to pass through the channel and talk to each other, um, cells that are actually next to each other, okay? So an example will be this pumping heart down here. This heart, all the muscles know how when to contract because the, the cells are lined up next to each other and the ion passes through, depolarizes the cell, and all the cells know from the signaling that they need to contract together. So that's one example. The other example is early in development. Okay, early in development, when cells are moving against each other, there's more and more cells, but they need to come together to become an organism. That makes sense. There's bone, there's muscles, there's uh, epidural cells. Um, how do I know what I need to become? So cell actually come into contact. So if I am one cell with the molecule, which is this pen, and the other cell with the receptor, then I come on top of you and say, hey, you need to become something else, and I am going to be the bone. You become the muscle, et cetera. Okay? So that's direct contact. Cells need to actually touch each other. That's the first type. The second type is called paracrine. These are short distance signaling. So when cells are talking to cells and they don't need to touch each other, like the picture right here, this cell is signaling to this cell through these ligands in green. They're not touching, do you see? Okay, so signal release from one cell that has effect on all the neighboring cell, so one cell can actually talk to multiple cells, then that's called paracrine signaling. Um, and again, an example is immune cells or early in development. When one cell is like, wow, there's bacteria, virus coming in, you know, we all need to act. The blood vessels needs to dilate. We need to have more white blood cell coming in. How do we do that? Then they send out um, signals called cytokines. So that's all paracrine. Okay, now the third type of um, cell signaling is called endocrine. It's when you're when cells are talking long distance. So one cell is far, far away and it dumps a signal into the blood vessel and that signal can reach somewhere distant. For example, estrogen or testosterone. These are made in your gonads. So for girls, that's in your ovary, and then it's dumped into the bloodstream where it can reach all over the body. And that's why um, during puberty, as more hormones are made, girls will start to produce more fat underneath their skin, as well as start to grow breasts. So all these cells are responding to the estrogen, which um, is signal um, sent out by ovaries. And this is called endocrine signaling. Now last, we're going to talk about synaptic signaling. This is specific to neurons, okay? So synaptic signaling is specific way of cell communication by neurons. It can be neuron to neuron, neuron to muscle. Why is it so special? Well, take a look here. Look at how they're talking. This nerve cell or neuron cells is actually packaging its signal into little vesicles and then send it into this little cleft called the synaptic gap. And thus the synaptic signaling. So any nerve cell never really touches the other cell. They're not talking through direct contact. It's actually sending off signal molecule into the cleft for the next one. And it's not paracrine because it's not signaling to all the neighboring cells, just that one cell it's talking to. Thus the synaptic signaling is specific to neuron cells. So that's the four um, cell signaling um, types. Now to think through another way of looking at it other than the four types, we can also think about signaling in terms of the kind of ligand and the kind of receptors. 
okay? So there are two major types of ligand and thus two major types of um, receptors. And you'll need to kind of know how to match each one up. Now, we started talking earlier on about how you think about a biomolecule, okay? And one of the main chemical traits is what? How they interact with water. So a protein can be hydrophilic or hydrophobic, like water-loving or water-fearing. Now, what you're seeing here, this is a ligand, this is a receptor, this is a ligand, and this is a receptor. What, what are these? What do you think this is? They're phospholipids, so they make up a cell membrane. This means this receptor is on the membrane, and it gets signal from outside, while this particular receptor is inside the cell, so inside the membrane which means this ligand needs to somehow cross the membrane to get to its receptor. Now, can you tell me which one is hydrophobic, which one might be hydrophilic? So thinking through this, you got to think about what can pass through membrane. Remember the fatty acids. Are they hydrophilic or hydrophobic? Will they allow hydrophilic ligand to pass through? No. So fatty acids are hydrophobic, and therefore it will allow hydrophobic molecules to come through. And therefore A is actually a hydrophobic ligand, and it can come in and actually bind to intracellular receptors, inside the cell receptors. This is a hydrophilic ligand that cannot pass the membrane, and therefore it binds to extracellular receptors. So hydrophilic ligand, cell surface receptors. Hydrophobic ligand, intracellular receptors. This is the, the hydrophilic ligand, and it binds to which kind of receptor do you think this is? It's on the cell surface, so cell surface receptor. This is intra, inside the cell receptors. This first stage, binding, receptor activation, and then signal transduction, cellular response, okay? So there are four types, specific types, but of that, you can also um, kind of separate cell signaling according to what kind of ligand or what kind of receptors, okay? Now, there's also three subclasses of cell surface receptors. So now I'm gonna dive in more into the cell surface receptor. I'm gonna give you examples of what kind of um, cell signaling uses cell surface receptors. And the three subclasses are chemically gated ion channel. So this type of receptors are channels. We talked about this before, okay? In earlier chapters, when we talked about chapter five, we talked about how these proteins can open up in the middle and become kind of like a barrel and, and allow the middle to be hydrophilic. So although it's sitting on the membrane, it's all hydrophobic around, these ion channels can open in the middle and ions are hydrophilic, they carry charge, and they can pass through because this protein is hydrophilic in the middle. So one type is chemically gated ion channel, the other type is enzymatic receptors. These are receptors that can serve as enzymes. What do enzymes do? They catalyze reactions. Last one, G protein coupled receptor. Okay, this one's the one that I'm gonna spend a whole separate video just talking through. This particular one will be the, one of those difficult concepts where you got to draw it out, you got to map it out. It's sequential, and we're going to work on unpacking that. So, G protein couple receptor. These three types are what kind of receptors? They are cell surface. So, they're on the cell surface. Here, this is the picture showing you. So, if a ligand comes and it binds to chemically gated ion channel, then the channel will open. Do you see that? So, once bound, you got receptor activation, and now the ions can come in. That's one type. Enzyme, enzymatic receptor. When the ligand comes, it binds to the enzyme, it activates it, and then now this enzyme can carry out chemical reactions. G protein coupled receptor. That's the last one. That's the one we're going to spend a whole video just talking through. Okay. And you can see 
this one is pretty detailed. So we're going to dive into how this all works out. It's called G-protein coupled receptors. Before I cut to that video to talk specifically about G-protein coupled receptor, GPCR, first I want to give you an idea of turning on a receptor and turning off a receptor. Okay. How do you turn on, how do you make a protein active? How do you make a protein inactive? So inside a cell, usually the switch is phosphorylation. That means we add a phosphate group. This is a verb. So when you phosphorylate, which is a verb, that's an action that you add phosphate onto a protein. Remember what charged phosphate is? Think back to nucleotide. We got phosphate group. What charge is that? It's negative. Okay. So by being charged, you can really change a protein's structure. Before, maybe I am very smooth and I don't have any charge. So I'm folded this way. But now you added a charge group here. So I'm going to change my structure because now there's a negative. Maybe. I was originally a positive right here. Now you added a negative, I'm gonna open up. So structural change could be induced by phosphorylation and this can then change the function. Remember structure determines function. So phosphorylation can, can be a very specific marker to change the function of an enzyme. And this is usually um, cells response to a signal to turn off on something and now the enzyme is activated it's going to start making a lot of chemical reaction go so phosphorylation is a common way to change the activity of a protein usually there's a name for the enzyme that adds phosph phosphate onto another protein it's called kinase okay so you got to know how to spell and you got to know this name protein kinase the definition is it serves to add phosphate onto a protein. Now, if you have something that adds phosphate, then you've got another protein that takes it off. That's called phosphatase. So we've gone over this. Anything with the ace, that's an enzyme. Kinase, add phosphate. Phosphatase removes phosphate. Okay, so let's look at it here. Soon I'm gonna make another video about the G protein coupled receptor so we got to talk about g protein it, it has the name g protein because it's actually bound to gdp or gtp now what gdp and gtp are is equivalent to adp and atp and we've talked about that quite a bit so this is guanosine triphosphate and diphosphate you can imagine once you add the phosphate it goes from diphosphate to triphosphate two phosphate to three phosphate and thus who catalyzed that who adds phosphate kinase okay and now it's active so anything phosphorylated usually active who adds phosphate kinase now who removes it phosphatase so when g protein is bound to gtp it's active when phosphatase removes that phosphate from the GTP, and now G protein is bound to GDP, it's inactive. What happens when it's active? It can go on and affect other protein. So signaling cascade, signaling transduction, and you can lead to various cellular effect that we previously talked about. Okay. So next video will be about g-protein coupled receptor <laughs>